On February 9th, 2007, a garbled radio message broke through the static. This is Kayak 1. I've got an emergency situation. I'm sinking. Do you copy? There was a brief pause, a crackle of static, then silence. It was Andrew McAuley's final transmission. At that moment, Andrew was just 30 kilometers off the coast of New Zealand, so close to completing his dream, a solo 1,000-mile kayak journey across the dangerous Tasman Sea. The message was unsettling, but no one believed things could have gone seriously wrong. After all, Andrew McCauley was no ordinary man. He was an adventurer, someone who had thrived in the world's most dangerous places, a man who had lived his life pushing the boundaries of human endurance. Born in Goldurn, New South Wales, Andrew's adventurous spirit was evident from a young age. He was a mountaineer, a sea kayaker, a man who constantly sought out the extreme. By the time he was 38, he had already achieved things that most people wouldn't dare imagine. The first non-stop kayak across the Boss Strait an expedition across the Gulf of Carpentaria and treacherous climbs in Pakistan and Patagonia. But the Tasman Sea, perhaps the wildest stretch of ocean between Australia and New Zealand, well, this was his ultimate goal. For nearly a decade, Andrew had been preparing for this moment. His custom-designed 19-foot kayak, a modified Mirage, was his lifeline. It had a small fiberglass capsule he called Casper, which allowed him to sleep inside, protected from the stormy sea. Andrew, he knew the risks. Freak waves, freezing temperatures, and brutal gales. Still, he had spent years meticulously preparing for every possible scenario. He wasn't reckless. He was calculated. It's an excellent, excellent, excellent adventure, he told the camera before setting off, provided I make it. He joked. On January 7th, 2000, Andrew embarked on his second attempt at the crossing after aborting an earlier attempt due to freezing conditions. For weeks, everything went according to plan. He sent regular updates to his wife, Vicky, and his team, describing the journey as exhilarating, though challenging. Each day brought him closer to New Zealand's shores. He had survived a 27-hour storm, capsized multiple times, and always recovered. There were doubts, whispers in the adventure community about the dangers he faced, but Andrew seemed to have it all under control. Then, on February 9th, 2007, the final message came through. I'm sinking. And just like that, Andrew McCauley disappeared. Andrew had been so close. On February 8th, a day before his disappearance, he had sent Vicky a message full of optimism. See you at 9 a.m. Sunday. He was only hours away from Milford Sound, where his family, friend, and fellow adventurers were gathering to celebrate his journey. They had champagne at the ready, waiting for his triumphant arrival. But the next morning, Andrew didn't arrive. At first, there was no panic. Maybe he had run into some small trouble, but Andrew always found a way to pull through. That evening, the New Zealand Coast Guard picked up a scrambled radio signal, barely audible. Initially, it seemed like a routine check-in from Andrew, but as the message was replayed, something more chilling emerged. The words help and sinking became abundantly clear. The search began immediately. Planes scoured the waters near the New Zealand coast, hoping to spot Andrew's kayak. For hours, there was no sign of him. But then, on the night of February 10th, search teams spotted his kayak, upturned, but intact. And it was just 34 miles offshore. It was eerily preserved. His paddle was inside, his emergency radio, his GPS, his satellite phone, all accounted for. But Andrew himself was gone. What happened? How could an experienced kayaker disappear so close to safety? The more investigators looked, the stranger the case became. The kayak showed minimal damage. It hadn't been destroyed by a wave. His gear was still functional, and yet Andrew hadn't triggered his emergency beacon. 
Paul Hewitson, the designer of Andrew's kayak, inspected the craft, searching for clues. He speculated that Andrew had capsized, something he had done before, but this time, the protective fiberglass cover Casper wasn't in place. That cover was critical, shielding him from waves and allowing the kayak to self-right. Without it, Andrew would have been thrown into the sea. In rough conditions, re-entering the kayak would have been a grueling task, even for somebody as skilled as Andrew. Hewitson believed that Andrew, possibly exhausted, might have struggled to right the kayak, eventually becoming separated from it. But why hadn't he activated the emergency beacon? Why, after surviving the worst storms, had Andrew lost control in relatively calm seas? These questions have absolutely haunted his family and the investigators looking into the case. The search for Andrew McCauley continued for days, but there was just no sign of him. On February 12th, three days after his final transmission, the official search was called off. For his family, for the community of adventurers who had followed his journey, it was an unbearable end. The ocean, it seemed, had claimed Andrew just as he was on the verge of completing his greatest feat. In the days that followed, more clues emerged, though none provided a definitive answer. Footage from Andrew's camera was recovered. In one of his final videos, recorded in the calm before his disappearance, Andrew speaks to the camera with a haunting mix of excitement and exhaustion. I may have bitten off more than I can chew, he says, his face gaunt, eyes hollow after weeks of battling the sea. But what exactly happened in those last moments? Did a rogue wave knock him out of the kayak? Did he misjudge the conditions, letting his guard down when safety seemed so close? The investigators, and quite frankly the rest of us, can only speculate. Some believed Andrew had removed his cockpit cover to access his dry suit or radio moments before disaster struck. Others thought fatigue had simply gotten the better of him after weeks of constant exertion. But the truth was, and to this day remains, that no one really knows. Andrew's body was never found. His family, especially his wife Vicky, has had to live with the ambiguity, the gnawing question of how things could have gone so wrong, so close to the end. At his service, his wife reflected on his life and his need to explore. She quoted him by saying, Man cannot discover new oceans unless he has the courage to lose sight of the shore. Andrew had the courage. He lost sight of the shore. And somewhere in the vast waters of the Tasman, he was lost as well. 